and what he had done. Uh, and so he um, basically uh, ran away um, in search of a solution, in search of uh, a way out of the negative karma that he had created. Uh, and so before long, uh, he meets uh, his teacher, Marpa, who is said to have been prophesied and destined uh, to be his teacher. And under the guidance of Marpa, uh, who was uh, very tough and also very demanding uh, with him. Um, but later we find out that the reason why Marpa was so tough with him was Marpa could see very clearly what kind of uh, negative karma Hilarepa had accumulated and that if Marpa did not use those uh, rough and tough methods with Milarepa, Milarepa would not uh, have developed um, the strength and the tenacity that was needed for him to purify all the ne negative karma uh, in that lifetime and become this great uh, example that, you know, a thousand years later, uh, everyone knows his name. Mm. Within his own lifetime, he probably wasn't that well known. He had a small band of disciples that followed him, lived with him, and he didn't have a permanent residence. Uh, he wandered from mountain range to mountain range, mm. preferred to live an itinerant lifestyle. So he was neither a conventional householder, you know, someone who has a family and land and, and a, a job to do, uh, to earn, you know, money and sustenance uh, to support his family. He wasn't that kind of, a, he, that wasn't the lifestyle he chose. And neither did he uh, join uh, monasteries and uh, remain in the monasteries. So he took, uh, you could say, a third alternative, which is a wandering itinerant uh, practitioner. Uh, which his con in his context, people recognize that category of wandering itinerant um, spiritual practitioners. And he lived very simple. Uh, even when he had become uh, well-known or well-known enough, uh, you see from reading these stories that him and, and his band of disciples continued uh, to live in uh, poverty, uh, often not knowing uh, where uh, this next meal is going to come from. Uh, and uh, so um, that was uh, the way Milarepa lived. Um, so we now are at the, towards the end of this collection under this um, section where it's called the miscellaneous songs, uh, miscellaneous teachings that he gave. So it's chapter 60. It's called Victory Over the Four Maras. Uh, so very briefly, we'll learn a little bit more about what these Maras are. Uh, literally, uh, Maras are uh, demons. Recording. Uh, demons that cause, uh, you know, uh, basically, you know, they are, they are the ones that bring things that we don't want briefly. So then, of course, there are different types of Maras. So here it's called the four Maras. And the response to a mantrika. A mantrika mm, denotes, uh, tells us that this is a person who uh, specialized in the use of mantras. But here there is a kind of a mm, here it's it's hinting or it, it's implying that uh, this is someone who used the art of mantras um, to solve uh, mundane problems, whether it's controlling the weather or defeating your enemy or having power over 
conditions uh, such as you know uh, easy access to food easy access to wealth uh, so this is someone who knows how to use the power of mantras to achieve uh, what the buddha might call worldly goals worldly aims so apparently you know mantras could be used that way of course in our buddhist practice we also use mantras but we say uh, we should not use mantras we should not cultivate the power of mantras for the achieving of mundane goals so the 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 implication here uh, and the response to a mantrika is uh, this person is using mantra in this way but what we shall see uh, Namo Guru, uh, homage to the guide. When Jisumilarepa was staying at the Poto Red Rock Sky Fortress, some students from Ralung in Dwin came to meet him. Please give us an instruction that will benefit our minds. The Jisun replied, if you all want to practice Dharma like me, it would be excellent for you to abandon all things opposed to Dharma as I have. Therefore, abandon them so of course then they say could you elaborate on what is opposed to dharma dharma is the teachings of the buddha and dharma is also the way things are the way things naturally are and that is the broader and more important meaning of dharma which is just the way things are. And sometimes this is translated as truth. And immediately, you know, as, since we are in a religious uh, or spiritual context, whenever the word truth is used, immediately in our minds, we capitalize the T, truth, you know. <laughs> I think there is an, there is some degree of idolatry of, of, of truth, you know. We objectify this truth, capital T, you know. So dharma, you know, in, in the more broader and more profound and more important sense, is simply you know, the way things are. As opposed to the way things appear to be. So when we say, you know, all things opposed to dharma, meaning all forms of confusion, all forms of wrong perception. Because it's wrong perception, or more to the point is, it is the way we habitually mistake, make the mistake of thinking that how things appear to us so things include people situations things how things appear to us to be how they truly are not understanding that there's a discrepancy between these two the way things appear to be and the way they truly are When we don't understand that there's a discrepancy between these two, and therefore simply, blindly, foolishly, habitually just take things on face value, that is where suffering originates. That's where suffering comes from. Because then, simply uh, taking, simply only seeing the way things appear to be, we start to act or react to that appearance, that brings what we call suffering, that brings dissatisfaction, that brings unhappiness. So here, they ask him, they say, so what are the things opposed to dharma? So in their minds, when they hear this, they're probably thinking more like things, because dharma, uh, in, in the way it's used in Tibetan, uh, chu, literally it is dharma, but to many Tibetans, especially yeah, the ordinary Tibetans, 
they are thinking you're talking about religion. So you could also say, what are the things opposed to religion then? I'm sorry about answers. Kaye, listen here, you students. One, activities without any end. They are opposed to dharma. Activities without any end. <laughs> Things that have no end, you know. Once you do. Once you get involved with them, you know, there's no end. Two, no satisfaction when trying to please others. <laughs> when you live your life, you know, just trying to please others. Three, idle chatter with no sign of weariness. Meaning you enjoy so much, you know, just blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't have, you know, any sense of weariness. Like, oh, this is so enjoyable, you know. <coughs> See, all of these, right? Activities without any end. He's not even talking about, like, objectively. Does this activity have any end or no end? He's talking about how you get involved in it and you, you are the one who is making no end to it. Those types of activities. Right? So it's not saying, you know, that certain activities, there are no end. Certain other activities, there are end. It's saying when you get involved in activities and you know no limit. You get caught up further and further and further and further and further and further. And further. Then that's something that is opposed to. And, you know, pleasing others itself is not yet a problem. But you, when you keep working on pleasing others, huh, and, and you keep not getting satisfaction, right? you keep getting frustrated with, how come I can't please everyone? Right? And have no understanding or recognition yeah, of the limits of trying to please everyone. Then you're in trouble. Likewise, idle chatter with no signs of weariness. Yeah, because sometimes we do have to engage in idle chatter. <laughs> so try to bring some uh, awareness to it. So try to bring some weariness, you know, that's just the reality, you know, in our workplace, in our social circles, yeah? if you don't engage in some degree of <laughs> idle chatter, blah, 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 uh, people uh, might have wrong conclusions about why you're not doing that. They're like, oh, that person is not friendly. Oh, that person is not a team player. And so maybe, you know, you see no choice. You're like, okay, I have to do a little bit of chit chat. So when you have to do that, remember, you know, like this is really tiresome. So do it. It's okay to do it if you do it reluctantly. <laughs> so you have to be skillful too, you know. Don't like overnight decide, you know, you're going to be Milarepa because that will only last for like a week, you know. It's not sustainable. <laughs> these three things are opposed to the genuine Dharma. I leave these three things far behind. If you leave them behind too, that would be excellent. To whatever degree we can leave these three things behind, to that degree, we can taste the freedom from these three things. In his case, you know, and he says, if you leave them far behind, you know, then it becomes an excellent situation. 
One, places that have rules and restrictions. <laughs> so here, right, what does he mean by that? You know, he's talking about worldly. Worldly, kind of secular, like, you know, oh, you have to dress this way and this way and this way. You can sit this way. You cannot sit that way. Actually, for example, Tibetan society, you know, uh, especially in his time, is very hierarchical. So every social event, you know, where you sit, how far you sit from the host, how far you are from the door, uh, all that has meaning. Uh, people will start, you know, fighting, like literally, like physically fighting because, you know, they were put at the wrong seat. So he's talking about these kinds of rules and restrictions. So he says, yeah, so basically he's saying, if you like to frequent these kind of places, you know, then there is no end to your suffering. <laughs> Two, groups that hope for something in return. If you hang out with people who have, who are welcoming of you because they expect something from you, then, you know, you know, you should know, you know. <laughs> There are strings attached. Three, having servants who required to please, who are required to please. And so, in other words, you know, to be served by people who are forced to serve you. There is no happiness there. For you, for that person, of course, and for you also, there is no happiness. Don't expect any kind of happiness for these from these three situations. These three things are opposed to dharma. I leave these three things far behind, and if you can leave them far behind, that will be excellent for you. Now, masters who have very little knowledge, meaning spiritual masters, meaning spiritual guides, have very little knowledge. Disciples who are without any faith, that's the other problem. You might have a master with a lot of knowledge, and this knowledge is not just book knowledge, yeah? And this is real knowledge, like knowing from experience, knowing theory, knowing from experience. And so you need to find teachers who are like that. Then the disciples, the students, need to have faith, confidence. And so here, having faith or having confidence, what is it talking about? It's talking. It's not talking about like uh, blind devotion. You know, it's talking about pride. It's very hard, you know, for people with pride uh, to recognize uh, that anybody else have anything worthy of their attention. When you have pride, you know, you cannot learn from anyone. You think that you know better. <laughs> But you're not receptive to what they have to say to you. you know, then, no matter whatever qualification this person has, uh, it's not helpful. So disciples who are without any faith, the implication there is, you know, disciples who are who think very highly of themselves, and then even if they meet a, a guide, a spiritual guide with a lot of knowledge and understanding, that guide cannot help them. Thirdly, Dharma friends who don't keep Samaya. Here meaning Dharma friends, fellow practitioners who don't love you. 
Samaya means commitment, but this commitment yeah, should not come from a place of threats, should not come from a place uh, of uh, scare tactics, you know, oh, you don't keep your Samaya, bad things will happen, you'll burn in hell. <laughs> Especially those of you familiar with Samaya talk you know, at, at a lot of Tibetan Buddhist centers, you know, Samaya talk, as, as far as I could tell, you know, is done in a very damaging way. But uh, Kyabje Gajen Rinpoche, you know, he says, Samaya is love. Of course, love in a particular context, in this context, it's talking about mutual care. That we are together and uh, not we don't have arguments, you know, not not that we don't have uh, differences of opinion, not that not 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 that, you know, that's not like the requirements of Samaya. The requirements of Samaya is that we care about each other. We don't take for granted, you know, that we are in the same, we say mandala, meaning having the same teachers having the same spiritual connections, uh, that we care about each other, we cherish each other, uh, we, 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 we have each other's best interest in mind. And he says, so if you have Dharma friends who, who don't appreciate this point, then it's useless to have a lot of Dharma friends, so-called Dharma friends. These three things are opposed to dharma. I leave these three things far behind. And if you can do that too, you know, that would be excellent. Then, husband and wife will always fight. <laughs> Enemy sons who come from your own body. So, in other words, here sons are singled out instead of daughters because of the way inheritance uh, happen in, in, in Tibetan society, right? So basically the people are going, who are going to inherit, uh, they are always coming, you know? <laughs> you know? They're always wondering, you know, hmm, when am I going to get all that stuff? Can I get some now? <laughs> yeah, so now it doesn't matter, sons, daughters, you know? But in the Tibetan context, it's the sons, you know? because the daughters you marry out. So they're someone else's problem, so to say. They won't even think of like getting anything from you. I mean, in the Tibetan context. But now, you know, whether sons or daughters, you know, if they're like vouchers, <laughs> like, when are you going to croak, you know? <laughs> then, they are, you know, just trouble. Three, angry servants who look after things. Angry servants who look after things. Let's look at the uh, footnote okay, that he provides here, 190. Let's see what it says. I'm curious. Oh, just in Tibetan, so never mind. <laughs> oh. Angry servants who look after things as in, you know, uh, they're not just looking after your things, they, they are looking after your things, you know. <laughs> these three things are opposed to Dharma. I leave these behind. If you can do that, then it will be good. Yeah. So some very practical advice for worldly people. The husband and wife that is always fighting, enemy sons, you know. Who, though they came from your body, they are watching to see when you're going to croak. <laughs> Servants who seemingly serve you, but mm -mm. they're after your things. Ah, then uh, the one about teacher, disciples, and Dharma friends, uh, specific to uh, spiritual context, spiritual community. Then getting exhausted by doing, doing, doing things that have no end. Gossip, chatter, without any sense of, you know, 
being tired. Busy trying to please others. Busy trying to please others is also, you know, a form of manipulation, control. So here in this short teaching, he covers both temporary happiness and ultimate happiness. Yeah. Questions, comments? <laughs> certainly think about all my scrolling that I do. <laughs> it's like, yeah, all right. Yes, the idle chatter, right? Yeah, that's the same thing, right? Oh. And so, Dr. Lai, besides not doing these things, which we can pay attention to, the basic practice he's offering is watching, what, paying attention, right? Paying I mean, attention to? Just paying attention, being aware of what you're doing. Yeah, Watch yeah. I mean, underlying, of course, is uh, skillful attention. Mm. Right. So, I mean, in the last chapter, he said something about, you know, just watch your mind and that's it. Mm -hmm. You know, watch your mm -hmm. mind. Yeah. Yeah, it seems uh, also at this point, you know, I mean, nowhere in this whole collection are there what we would recognize as standard practices. Yeah. Were they not doing it? Or were they doing it and there's no mention of it? It's hard to tell. <laughs> I mean, there's always these references of him taking a student aside and telling him to do such yes. And such. Right. Yes. So I think. Yeah, so what to me? What what I think is is telling us is is not that they were not doing, or that they don't have like more formal or specific practices. Mm -hmm. That they were, as you pointed out, you know. But the people who compiled this, put this together, felt that. That's not useful to put in here. Meaning they're all tailored to the needs of different disciples. So this is, I think, at a stage where direct instruction from teacher to student was still available and possible be before, you know, Dharma communities became uh, kind of so big, right? Yeah. That you now have to go through a, the same curriculum. There's no standardized curriculum, I, I, you know. Did, did those things exist at that time? or No, I don't think so. Okay. I think it's much later when uh, uh, things became both like uh, sectarian identity became stronger, more people became involved, and therefore there were more students than guides available. So things got more and more organized and streamlined and, and standardized, and for good or for bad, you know. <laughs> But they did have the basic Buddhist teaching of, 
of shamatha, right? I mean, shamatha vipassana or... Depends, I think, you know, how it's introduced to students. Uh, no, I, it's not, we're not saying that there aren't like specific techniques and practices. They're all there, but it's just not the case that everybody, you start with this. Yeah, okay. Or that. I don't think that was there. It all depends, you know. Okay. That was like so frequently in here, for those of you who are familiar with these topics, you see that Milarepa first does what we now call introduction to nature of mind. To random people who, 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 who run into him, you know. These days, the introduction to the nature of mind comes way, way down the road. Yeah. Yeah, and often kind of like made into like, you know, very special occasions. But many cases you see, you know, Miller ever immediately, you know. <laughs> but you know, in the last, my nature. In the last chapter, just for a second, you know, it on the first song in that chapter, basically they said, um, teach us Dharma. And he basically broke it down, superior men, middling men, lesser men, superior women. Basically, what we concluded was that there's something everyone can do, depending on circumstances. It's not that no one's able or that you are unable. It's there's something everyone can do. And, uh, but he doesn't say what exactly, <laughs> except to go for refuge and then basically watch your mind. Mm -hmm. And so that was, yeah, that was reflect carefully, look at your own mind. That was it. Mm -hmm. And um, the common one. And, and so, I mean, I, is, it, is it fair to say that all the Buddhists at that time of every stripe were watching their minds? That was the fundamental instruction. Yes. Um, Buddha, yeah. Okay. It's just a matter of context. I, Tibet was kind of the Wild West, uh, you know, in some respect. Or I mean, because I, 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 11th century India was more organized, were they not? Or I had that impression with Naropa, um, Nalanda, and universities. Yes. Yes, some branches of uh, definitely, you know, philosophical studies and, and, and curriculum and all of that. Yeah. And some people in Tibet during that time uh, uh, considered that to be really important. And so, you know, in a different valley, they were doing that. Again, not universalized. The Larepa's tradition, you know, clearly downplays the importance of systematic study. Yeah, then in this next section, uh, it seems like Milarepa keeps falling. Getting older at this point too, but, but there's several cases of him falling. Uh, and, 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 and disciples are afraid that he has hurt himself and then turns out, mm, no, it didn't really hurt him. And so the first time he falls according uh, in this section, uh, I was blown by a great, a giant gust of wind, the result of the harm done by this mindless tree. <laughs> As in, the tree has no consciousness, you know. Mm, but nonetheless, yeah. Uh, 
was pain that was unbearable. The result of the harm done by this mindless tree was pain that was unbearable. But then the Dakinis gave me their medicine. It's it's hard to know exactly, you know. Uh, uh, did they literally find him completely unharmed? Or despite you know, breaking bones and tearing skin and shedding blood, he was not harmed. It didn't disturb his mind, and it wasn't real threat, you know, to his physical life. On another occasion, uh, he fell again. When they went to take up his corpse, they saw him sitting there laughing. They asked him what had happened. I extended the voucher wings of union and flying, I flew down from Red Rock's peak. Falling, I fell into a deep abyss. Playing, I played a joke on my students. Liberating, I was liberated from samsara and nirvana, pointing out. I've pointed out bliss emptiness. <laughs> okay. So all these occasions of alarm, uh, I think to appreciate that, you really have to understand, okay, now he's an old man. He's looking feeble, you know, more prone to accidents. But in, in these occasions of accidents, uh, there's a lightheartedness. So he's unencumbered, you know. Another time when Milarepa was sitting beside a great rock, a young girl came to him repeatedly telling him that he shouldn't sit there. Then the rock began to slide away. The wrathful gaze and wrathful mudra, Milarepa scattered the rock in every direction. Disciples, thinking that he has been seriously injured, ran over, and then he again he sang. This flower of a yogi's body, the Takini saved from the life-crushing blow of this red rock, Mara's executioner. I never worried that such a Mara would take me. So several occasions uh, uh, in his old age, you know. <laughs> living out in the wild has become more and more uh, dangerous but he wasn't you know, worried at all so the disciples were all kind of like like how you know how in all these cases uh, he didn't him to be unharmed and so he says my skandhas my aggregates has been transformed into the rainbow body and my afflictions transform into wisdom since i understand birthlessness i will never die since i have thrown the eight worldly concerns to the wind it is a sign that the four mars have been brought to shame so the disciple says so you have defeated the four mars yes indeed Furthermore, my lineage for 13 generations will not be plagued by such maras. Uh, so apparently for the first 13 generations, you know, <laughs> they were all doing well. So if you start counting, I don't know. I think we have gone beyond the 13. <laughs> There is some significance there. Uh, I think uh, the 13th generation, uh, whoever compiled this, they have a very specific kind of generation in mind, you know. Like up until that generation, you know, all the disciples were, were doing well, practicing well, and therefore uh, showing signs, results of their practice. And then, ah, uh, 14th generation, oh boy. Went downhill. <laughs> it's all downhill, you know, after the 14th.
anyway, now here enters the mantrika from central Tibet. Then Seben Repa, one of his close disciples, Mila Repa's disciples, asked him, <clears throat> asked this, this, uh, this mantrika, what kinds of siddhas, what kinds of, you know, accomplished beings are to be found in the land of central Tibet? And the mantrika replied, there are practitioners whom the spirits give service. Central Tibet, there are such great practitioners that the spirits, the ghosts, and the, the unseen beings serve them. Then Seben Ripa turned to his teacher, Milarepa, and said, Does the Jitsun also receive such service from these you know, spirits and gods? Milarepa says, I receive it in this way. Now the four Maras. The footnote here, right? What are the four Maras or demons? They are the Mara of the Skandhas, meaning our psychophysical uh, components of our this this person. You know, when when you say who what what is over here, you know, when you point like this and say what is over here? Well, what you can account for is uh, a bunch of mental emotional processes going on and a bunch of physical processes going on so these are called skandhas some of us might say oh but there's also me self soul and the buddha says well that is an article of belief that's a faith based proposition what what undist to undisputably that you you can account for is when you say this i it's a compound of mental emotional processes and physical processes so these are called skandhas aggregates heaps heaps of red bean black beans you know Long beans, uh, lentils, uh, heaps of them uh, put together, then you have a person. That is called a Mara, a demon. Why? Because when we don't recognize the heap like nature, the compounded nature of this, then it becomes a Mara. Likewise, the demon of death itself. Again, it's not like death itself in the end is the problem. It's not recognizing death. Not recognizing the reality of death. Then the Mara of the afflictions, the afflicted emotions, the destructive emotions, the mental defilements. Then the fourth is called Mara of the Godly Son. This is referring to pride, puffed up, because things are going so right. Things are going so well. Then when you feel like that, you know, when you experience that, and then you are under the power of this divine son, yeah. Feeling on top of things. Uh, the other three, yeah? you're not necessarily feeling like you're on top of things, yeah? on top of the world, doing so well. You know, the other three, uh, in a way, they are easy to recognize as Maras. The fourth one is the Mara of getting lost in things going well, <laughs> and not seeing you know that even when things are going well their nature is that they are compounded and things that are compounded you know can shift and change very easily so these are the four mars the four demons <laughs> Uh, 
Anyway, so Milarepa says, yeah, explains, uh, this is how I receive the service of the ghosts and spirits, through the cooking and boiling of samadhi. Thus, like an inexhaustible treasury of space, I'm without desire for food. I'm without desire for food, for hunger and thirst. That is looked after by the Dakinis. But I have no thought that this makes me a Siddha. Cooking and boiling of Samadhi means the Samadhi here refers to the stability of the mind. So that is unmoving. But more specifically here, I would say in the in this context, this samadhi is not just that the mind doesn't move, the mind is equal and stable, but stably in the state of bodhicitta, of benefiting beings. But when he abides in that, it's like in an inexhaustible treasury. This is a mythic uh, thing. In Indian, uh, in the Indian imagination, that there is a treasury, uh, there, there, that there's a, a, a vault uh, in space uh, mm -hmm. that certain people have, you know, found and discovered, so that you know whatever they reach for into this vault, uh, they can get. Kind of like the wish fulfilling gem, uh, but this is imagined as a vault, uh, as a a treasury uh, hidden somewhere in space. Says, but when my mind is in the samadhi of bodhicitta, of benefiting beings, of doing everything for the sake of others, then I'm without desire. I don't even need food and drink. So this is in response to uh, the mantrika saying, you know, oh, in central Tibet, you know, the gods, spirits serve uh, these powerful practitioners. Milarepa says, I don't even need that. Because I'm not even looking for food and drink anymore. Then the mantrika says, you know, so, so this is sort of the mantrika realizing, oh, Milarepa is saying that, you know, being served by the gods and spirits is something minor, something kind of lowly. So then the mantrika said, what about, you know, those practitioners who have visions of their idam deity, meaning the deity of choice, you know, who they meditate on, you know, who they train you know, in doing meditations on. Can those people who have visions of these deities be considered accomplished? Milarepa responds, if you see the essence of mind and clear away the darkness of ignorance, the Dakinis will also show their faces to you. Dakinis are the wisdom beings. Imagine as female. In the expanse of Dharmata, there is nothing to be seen. It is free of reference point without mental engagement. All dharmas are themselves self-arisen and self-luminous. Here dharmas in this context refers to phenomena, all things. They are self-arisen and self-luminous, meaning their nature. This is spoken of by the Tahakinis. There is no more powerful speech than the Guru's speech, which says, the ordinary and the supreme, all one needs should be accomplished in this life. The Dakinis too have said, but even with this, I have no thought of being a Siddha. Larepa says, you know, more important than seeing uh, the, your, your deity of choice face to face is to seeing is to see the nature of your mind. But even this, 
I don't go around thinking I'm a great practitioner, which is what a Siddha is. Thus he sang, and the man said, with what example can the mind be illustrated? So basically, this mantrika now is asking Milarepa for the important teachings. Like, show me, you know, this mind that you're talking about. Milarepa sings this song, final song in this chapter. This mind itself that is unborn cannot be illustrated by any example. This mind itself that's without any seizing can be exemplified by anything for those who don't realize it. Uh, it's very tricky. For those uh, who understand, then what they understand is this mind cannot be illustrated by any example. But for those who don't realize it, then they're looking for you know, kind of ordinary reference points. Eh? And then they get the satisfaction of thinking, oh, I understand now. Oh, the mind is like this, like this, like this, like this. And he says, that's only because they have not directly realized it. They have directly realized it, and then they will know, you know, not what you think it is. <laughs> but the realized one, the mind itself, and example and exemplified are not two different things. It is beyond any object of thought or expression. This is the blessings of the lineage. How wondrous. Thus he sang, then the man's latent tendencies awaken, and he attained unwavering faith in the Jitsin, whom he then followed and attended. Milarepa gave him the Abhishekas, the empowerments, and key instructions, and the man practiced, becoming a yogi with outstanding realization. And so this mantrika that came from central Tibet became his disciple, joined him. Chapter 60. <laughs> so do you think we recognize this mind when we see it, even though we can't talk about it or describe it? I mean, nonetheless, when you see it, in, you recognize it. Mm, I think we see it all the time. We just don't recognize it. Therefore, it's not seeing. Therefore, there's no realization. Not actually realizing it. Yeah. But the last time when we asked you about blessings, and you gave the uh, analogy of a person in, in, in darkness, in total darkness, mm -hmm. and then this light, a flash of lightning, yes. whatever illuminates what's there in the yes. darkness, that person who that happens to doesn't have to have any they can just get it theoretically you know I mean I don't know what I'm trying to ask you I feel like I've seen it in people I've seen people and I think whatever that is that is right there in that person I want that I mean I know that's that's it you know uh, that's the result of seeing the nature of mind and sta stabilizing. Then their qualities uh, yeah. have risen. What you're seeing are the qualities. You're not seeing the nature of their mind. Okay. You're just seeing the effect of having seen the nature of mind and then uh, train in stabilizing the seeing. Yeah, realizing the mind is not enlightenment, okay? It's the gateway to enlightenment.
Yeah, especially in the Kagyu system, whenever they use expressions like seeing the nature of mind, we, we think, oh, is that the same as, you know, Siddhartha under the tree? No, Siddhartha under the tree and what happened there is after lots and lots of, you know, stabilizing and purifying. Being the nature of mind is just, you know, catching a glimpse of what is. And that glimpse sometimes is caught in such a brief moment that that there is some recognition, like on, on, on one level, you're like, oh, right? But then quickly it kind of goes away. Yeah, Those moments we all have experienced. Where temporarily, uh, even just for the briefest moment, uh, the subject-object divide has dissolved, uh, not in operation, but you are not like zoned out, you are present. Yeah? And some kind of vastness you experience, you know, some kind of like inspiration, tremendous kind of... Uh, appreciation like arises right yeah so so we have those glimpses because they are naturally occurring sometimes not even in a quote-unquote spiritual context but for the most part even when we have those very uh, kind of ephemeral but powerful experience it just fizzles off and some of us might have a memory of it. Some of us have a memory of a memory of it. <laughs> right. But if when you have that experience and is occurring in the context where a teacher can skillfully guide you into returning to that, stabilizing that, using that to help you cut away uh, those three things that are opposed to Dharma, three things that are opposed to Dharma, three things that are opposed to Dharma, when you can begin to train like that. And it's helpful and it works. So the problem I think for us is that we are more or less, you know, we myself included, we are part-time practitioners. We don't live in an environment that is conducive for that. But we go to intensive retreat a week, two weeks, three weeks, you know, in the context of that, we glimpse something and then we go back into madness. Hmm. You know, we don't live in environments. We don't put ourselves in containers that that can uh, take us to the next step, you know. So in, a, in many ways, I think we all have had so many false starts so that the starts are not where we are lacking. The continuity is where it's lacking. But I want to have my, the cake and eat it too. Yeah. Sounds so like you're saying Therefore that going nowhere in particular. It sounds like um, our habit of cognition, actually, or, or trying to turn this opening of this ex experience of mind into something that you can identify. That cognition, oh, look what just, oh, now it's gone. It evaporates completely when you try to grab it with a, oh, this is what I'm experiencing, identifying it. The identifying of the nature of mind actually kind of stops the continuation of it. Is that the experience of it? Does that sound right? Um, I'm emphasizing more the lack of uh, an, uh, a helpful environment. Hmm. 
I think that's something that we have to really think about. <laughs> so how, how would you, what is a healthy environment? How would you describe a healthy environment? Um, I can say we are lacking it. <laughs> because we're not willing, uh, for the most part, you know, to give up something to go into that environment. That's called renunciation. Yeah, traditionally is to join the monastery or to join Milarepa, you know. But we say, oh, no, we can't, you know. <laughs> yes. Uh, would you say something about the role of practice with regard to uh, what I perceive as a wearing away of the delusion? Uh, it seems like it's what we're talking about has been presented as somewhat discreet. You're over there and you get it for a brief period of time, then you're back over here and you don't get it. Um, but I kind of conceive of it more as a access of something that is baseline to mm -hmm. what you are and to try to achieve that through practice and wearing in a way of the delusion that we live in mm -hmm. i don't know yeah so the environment i'm talking about is whatever can be conducive in continuing to wear it away but that's the problem You know, we don't wear it, wear it away enough to counteract the piling it on. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've run into this difficulty frequently with the idea of something that you achieve as in work, 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 boop, achieve the goal. But I this doesn't seem it just doesn't feel right to me. To me, it's something that you work on and becomes clearer and clearer and clearer as you continue to do the work. Um, yes, so yes. it's like a transition that takes perhaps many lifetimes. It's not something you're just gonna pop onto. But I have heard that some experience something more immediate. Yes. Well, Wait, so it's like two different question? ways of presenting the concept. Is there a question? <laughs> yes. Would you, which one of those two, or do you think they're incompatible? Are they they're not mutually exclusive? It works differently for different people. Of course, it's wearing away. You know. And of course, there are moments where you, you there's a powerful threshold that you cross. Yeah. So now what I'm saying is like our wearing away sometimes is not fast enough, not intense enough, because it's not just a wearing it away. At the same time, we are like adding more delusions. But to get a sense of what it's like on what I would refer to as the other side is really transformative because you have some idea what. Yes. Over there. And so a lot of people have gone to retreats and done some intensive weekend or week long and have those powerful moments. And then we go back to life as usual. I guess I tend to think that I brought that back. Not that I'm in that state all of the time, but I understand so that it, it exists. That experience gets worn away by delusions. Yeah, but it can be reinforced by practices. That's really the question. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> of course. 
question I'm raising is enough or not? I find my ego wanting to argue against that and I know it's wrong. <laughs> Yeah, you know, enough or not. It seems to me like in the past, householders have reached enlightenment. I assume that that's true. And, and we're all in like pretty much householder situations. So there has to be something that can be done to keep that. I'm way far from even beginning to keep the delusions away. But it seems like there ha it has to be possible. Of course, doesn't matter, you know, past, present, future. We ask ourselves. Yeah, I'm. I'm not saying, you know, that uh, you have to abandon this and go take that. No, I, all I'm saying is, know how much effort we are putting in, and then don't expect things that have no causes. You get what you pay for. Yeah. Yeah. No. There are no results without the proper causes. Directly <laughs> proportional. I'm not arguing. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to say that um, something else that's very powerful. Like we spend a lot of time teaching people who've never heard of Buddhism, never heard of meditation, totally, you know, unexposed to any of this stuff. And just the idea that they are not their thoughts, that there's something else mm -hmm. possibly going on besides what they think, you know? They walk out, I think, they tell me they walk out with this like curiosity about watching everything that happens, you know? Hey, yes. maybe my brother is not the asshole here. Maybe it's yes. how I'm looking at yes. something. So there is all this continuous opening that can happen just yes. because of course. this idea, right? But then but then you're saying, to t and we are all feeling that. I think that's what I'm feeling <laughs> like. Wait a minute, I've got this. I've got this much, you know, but you're saying there's more, and if we leaned harder into it, we would Yeah, there's it. always next step, you know? Always more, yeah, okay. I'm saying to myself, you know, I'm yeah. 52 now. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can say to yourself, whatever your number is, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah, and say, well, let's, let's audit the situation, you know? Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah and then decide you know what can i simplify yeah so another word for renunciation is what can i simplify you know mm -hmm. yeah you're like no i still have to you know bills don't pay themselves well that i cannot simplify there well there's nothing to beat yourself over about it it's i'm not talking about that but i am talking about you know you got to start auditing the situation. <laughs> yeah. and, and decide, you know, what can I simplify? <laughs> what kind of an environment eh, can I create that will uh, serve better the wearing down of the delusions? that will make it easier, that will make it more conducive, and that will make it more helpful. And how often am I still creating the conditions for the howling up of confusion and delusions? And then in those area, again, you know, like you, you have to look, you say, well, I don't think I have much of a choice because of this, that, 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 or that reason. Fair enough, you know. <laughs> like, no choice. Yeah, okay, no choice, you know. 
have to take stock of like you know the situation like you know from time to time right this these uh come to jesus moments you know you have to do it yourself there's no confessor in this tradition you know yes there is the the guru the teacher principle you know but yeah these days you know we also find it hard we're not willing discipleship is hard you know <laughs> both hard because you know teachers don't want to be teachers and Students don't want to be students. <laughs> so then more general guidance, you know, is what we get and what we're willing to give to. Then the, the onus, you know, the, the burden is in our own hands. Yeah. We, we need to do that stop taking ourselves. We need to do an inventory <laughs> from time to time and figure out, you know, how can I simplify? Yeah. How can I simplify my complicated world, which is the things that he just talked about, you know? Work that has no end. Why? Because we... Don't make a point to end them. Idle chatter without weariness. <laughs> so what he described there, you know, it's 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 the inventory taking that I'm talking about. It's the auditing that I'm talking about. You know, like we could learn song after song after song. You know. But really, one song is enough to take us very far if we, we really take it seriously. <laughs> yeah, like one song and say, you know, I'm going to work on this song for the next month. If you actually go take, take inventory on, on this song, this specific song, you know, uh, for one month, you know, I think you'll find out a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, you, you can you, you you can put yourself, you know, in a situation that is more conducive. So if you go back to the beginning of chapter sixty, you know, those are the things uh, to to take an inventory of activities without any end. No satisfaction when trying to please others. Idle chatter with no signs of weariness. Places that have rules and restrictions. Groups that hope for something in return. Having servants who are required to please you. Masters without much knowledge. Disciples without much faith. There are my friends who don't keep samayas. Husband and wife will always fight. Enemy sons who come for your own body. Angry servants who <laughs> take your things. Uh, looking, af looking after your things, you know. Take stock of those things, you know. What can we simplify? What can we reduce? If samsara can very naturally kind of thin itself out, we would have thinned out everything long time ago. This is, is swimming against the current. <laughs> samsara flowing this way, you know, we just float, float, float. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, we, we kind of float to a nice part of the river, you know, we're like, ah, this feels like nirvana, you know. <laughs> But it's not, it's like, it'll just keep flowing that way, you know? <laughs> you gotta stream upwards. Knowing when to rest, you know, when swimming upwards is really important. 
Otherwise, you'll burn out and then <laughs> drag down the river. So finding these like, uh, you know, little coves, right? It's really important. But don't forget, you know, in the process of waking up, it's always swimming against the stream. Always against the stream. <laughs> okay. That's it for today. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next Sunday. Let's see. Yeah, I may or may not. It's getting more complicated because I'm going to Asia for two months. So we have a 12 hour difference. Oh. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I leave choose this coming Tuesday. So uh, we'll see. Uh, if I'm awake enough, you know, because basically <laughs> it means midnight is when uh, I'm, I'm 13 hours ahead of you guys. Uh, so it'll be like midnight to 1 a.m. So I don't know. <laughs> Where in Asia? Where in Asia are you going? Uh, first Malaysia, then Indonesia, then in between there's Thailand and Singapore to the north and south. <laughs> okay. Yeah. When back in november end of october uh home in time for halloween yay uh, okay okay <laughs> yeah so uh, i think y'all might be starting the lojong so one way is to start the lojong by listening to uh i don't know if it is helpful I mean, I don't know if you necessarily need to sit together and listen. You might have homework and say, hey, this coming Sunday, we're going to read, you know, the beginning of Lojong, but you should really go listen to this teaching first. Then you can come together and discuss and, you know. Are you going to let us know what to read? Uh, I think we're been discussing this uh so you know maybe cheryl will you know I, I don't know like there's still some miller effort to complete but uh uh we have already kind of you know suggested um but basically lojong and basically there are so many now teachings from so many teachers uh, so so i was suggesting uh everybody reading a different commentary uh, so that at each meeting you need to know uh we are at this part you know so you read the book that you read and then you you bring like a, a book report of what you have read for that line for that line for that line that line and then you can also then everybody if you want you can listen to my take on that particular line and then bring all that together so that it becomes a not not you know we're not doing this to say who's right who's wrong but now, all the kind of vantage points yeah? because this is one text that where so many teachings and most recently of course Kentro Rinpoche's book so, just, I'll do his yeah surprise surprise <laughs> uh, so you know so it can be a very rich experience you know cool. we will figure that out Dr. Lai like, while you're gone yeah okay uh, so we will miss you and have a safe trip thank you uh, yes yes wish me well the next two days that's usually the most like stressful so to say <laughs> all right okay. we i hope that goes that. well yeah thank you so thank you Ta -ta. Ta -ta. <laughs> cheryl, cheryl i'm on my way down there okay okay <laughs> Greer, say. Greer, stay there. Okay, okay, <laughs> I will. I'd love to see you. Okay. Sarah, I'm going to text you now. Hi. Okay. Hey. okay. Oh. I'm turning off the recording. Hello. So, uh, how hello. do we access the hello. recording? Hello. Oh, uh, do you don't get it in Melissa's emails, I bet you. Um... So you have to email Melissa uh -huh. and get her to put you on her list of people she emails all the time. 
And um, her email is on the website. Yeah, yeah, I can find her. And tell her because I've put them all there also the other way. So she sends the link. We post it. Oh, okay. And she sends the link out. Right. But also, if you go to uh, YouTube mm -hmm. and search for Ecumenical Buddhist Society, there's a Doctor Live playlist. Okay. There. And I used to keep them private, but I went back and made them all public. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, I've been trying to read some earlier things in here since yeah. I'm this. Yeah. And I, if he has some commentary, if he taught some of those, right. I'd really like to see them. They would be good. And I went back and I, re and I labeled them. I did this a couple of weeks ago. Labeled the video with what chapter he talks about. So this is easy for you to find what you're looking for. And I heartily recommend them because listen to him. He's just so. That was amazing. Isn't it? That was amazing. It's always like that. He just I starts talking. I've hardly ever had a teacher who made things so concrete about mm -hmm. daily life. Right. That, it, I'm amazed. Right. He's fantastic. And uh, that's why we love him. Okay, so I, I guess my mind missed something, but so the next thing we're going to do is a study of some book of Lojong. Is that yeah. correct? And yeah. we're going to try to do um, different commentaries, be assigned different commentaries to, to come in and comment on that part. Yeah, and, and you probably know, I don't know, how do we go look at his teachings on the Lojong? They're probably, because he keeps saying, you should watch my teachings on the Lojong and then read some other book on the same part of it, you know, point one or point whatever, and then we'll talk, you know. So where do we, do you know? I have never noticed Lojong teachings, but I had been looking for them, but they're either on YouTube yeah. under one of his channels, which right. would be Dragoon Dharma Kurdi or Urban Dharma, right. or they're on the Dragoon Dharma Kurdi website. Right. So this is what, I mean, I'm just about to leave also for three weeks. So this is what um, Melissa needs to organize, or you, you guys need to help her organize. A, give everybody a link to finding the videos he's re talking about. Right. And then B, uh, the books, I, I wrote to him and Melissa, and I walked, wrote to our bookstore, Ellis, mm -hmm. and said, these are Lojong books, are these the ones? And Dr. Lai said, sure, those are fine. And there's the one, Kentra Lodra Taye just came out with one. There, Pema wrote about it in right. her book. Which one of her books was she talking about? Start Where You Are. She doesn't go from A to B like that. But if you're saying, let's read the first one, you think, look up in the book where she talks about that. Okay. But then there's Shogun Trumpa, then there's, you can read Dugo Kensi Rinpoche. So what we've done is ask Ellis to order a supply of these main books mm -hmm. that should come into the bookstore. We haven't told them when they're needed because we didn't have, now we have a deadline, end of October. Mm -hmm. So he said he just needs a couple of weeks to get the books here. And how many different books are there? There's dozens. But the ones, but the ones that we've that talked you, about. Okay, yeah. so there's a really traditional one from Dildo Kinsey Rinpoche. Mm -hmm. And he just tells what, they, what the points of Lojong are. But it's the classic presentation if you wanted that. And then there's Chogum Trumpa with his goofy uh, psychologically oriented take on things, practical, modern, contemporary take on things. I don't know what Kentrell's book is like, it just came out, okay. but um, it'll be refreshing to see what he has to say. And then Pema, who integrates it with her usual, like, how to help yourself mm -hmm. stuff. Um, so I those was, are four. Those books. are four? Yeah, so the idea is you pick one, you look at them and pick one that appeals to you and then you can read that, you don't have to read all of them. I, read, I did a book group a, a few years ago with the Chucky Nima World where we read Pema and Dilgo Kinsey Rinpoche, it's called Enlightened Courage, side by side. So we had 
the classic take on things that we had Pema's take, and it was very fruitful. And uh, June Stewart just finished doing a book group of that book, Start Where You Are, and so. We're not finished yet, but. Um, yeah. That's, it's really kind of mixed in with other things. It's not just all. It isn't, she never really did a kind of yeah. start to finish Lojong right. book. When I search under Lojong and Dr. Lai videos, I get this stuff for radical compassion. That's not the same stuff, is it? I don't know. Okay. You may have to, you know, you may have to get oh. help from somebody. Melissa did the program, I think. Hopefully she knows. Maybe she did, yeah. But this we would start when he gets back. Is that the idea? Right. That's the idea. That okay. is what we would do with him. And next between after this now one. and then, we could talk about the earlier chapters okay. of Milarepa. We could pick a couple. But you won't be here, right? I won't be here. But okay, you guys so will be here. Melissa will be here. Okay. You could have his video. You could literally watch his video together. All right. Well, I'm, just I'm sure email Melissa, Melissa can find it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be gone a lot too, so. I mean, the good news actually is that he's got all these teachings on video, so you can be wherever you are and kind of mm -hmm. bring the book with you and enjoy them. Yeah, I just, I really like being with real people. It yeah. makes a difference. To me, it does make a difference. To me, I mean, maybe not everybody. No, me too. So, what is Dilgo's, the rest of his name? Dilgo can't say, ah, the book is in the library. Let me go get one, I'll show you. Okay. It's a, it's a good one to use if you want. A classic reference book. Okay. On the Dracoon Dharmakirti site, there's a section called Mahayana Lojong in Seven Points. And it's got 16 videos. And, and which song are you talking about? Drakun Dharmakirti. D R I K U N G. D H R. D H A R N A. And you're talking about Dr. Lai song, it's name? Yes. Okay. K I M R T. It's a nice little book, but it's very simple. He just does the slogans and the teachings. And 